it's really a pleasure to be here and um, to try and, and bring this day towards a conclusion. Um, I, of course, have greatly benefited by having a lot of very good and very knowledgeable speakers um, lay a tremendous amount of uh, material before you. And what I'm going to do largely is to draw selectively on some of those pieces uh, um, to try and give you a, a bit of a synthesis of my thinking about this. Now, I, I think that it's fairly clear that the practice of scholarship in all areas, um, humanities, sciences, engineering, even performing arts, is changing pretty significantly as a consequence in large measure of technology, but also being driven by some social forces that are demanding, in some cases, um, uh, more rapid progress on um, issues of societal interest that are asking questions about the relevance and indeed even the accuracy in some cases of research. There's certainly a um, consistent kind of um, undercurrent of, of demand for greater accountability and reproducibility. Um, we've seen a number of uh, science and social science topics become quite controversial. We've seen, unfortunately, um, some rather high visibility um, uh, examples of um, scientific fraud um, and misconduct over the past decade. You have all of these trends happening. It's clear that scholarly publishing and scholarly communication is getting roiled uh, in part by economics, in part by technology, in large part by the changing practices of scholarship itself. So we're looking at a, I think, pretty complicated environment which is changing or perhaps diversifying would be a more accurate word at a considerable clip. Now, the point of our session today is to talk about open access. And in fact, we've talked about um, a number of different facets of the open access issue. But I think that sometimes it's really important to go back to first principles here. And so I want to start by connecting very explicitly to the comments that um, uh, Dave Schulenberger made, and in particular some of his reference to the joint work that my organization joined with his in the Association of Research Libraries um, to try and move forward in the form of a call for action to, um, to uh, universities. And really what that call for action says, or at least the way I'd frame it, is twofold. One is how should these institutions become more involved in the dissemination of their scholarship to the public, to other members of the scholarly community, to society at large? There are a million tools for that. There are university presses. There are publishing programs attached to libraries. There are simple mandates to the faculty that say, go out and publish, um, there are, which frankly is the scholarly communication strategy that many universities, especially in the states, have used as their primary one. It's not, it's not an institutional problem, fundamentally. You're expected to publish. We um, we judge you in part on your publication record, but um, many universities in the states, historically, particularly, have historically sort of said, yeah, but the actual mechanisms of publishing are someone else's problem. We see all kinds of new tools showing up, um, ranging from things as diverse to inst as institutional repositories to alliances with public broadcasting as a way of getting out um, new knowledge. 
the other piece of this question um, about how to advance scholarship, teaching, and learning um, gets to ideas around democratizing knowledge, opening up scholarship to everybody around the world at various kinds of different levels. And there are a lot of implications to that that I think are poorly framed. There are implications that are as, as, as simple as to the extent that we can open up the scholarly literature, we can open it up to students both in the United States and elsewhere who aren't able to get this. Maybe they're just gifted high school students who don't happen to be near a big university. Maybe they're someplace in a poor nation. Um, doing this is all part of the agenda of advancing scholarship. Um, there's an idea in here about accelerating scholarship as well, um, about the notion that if we can speed up the pace of scholarly communication, if we can share data effectively and reuse it intelligently, that we can in fact not only advance um, scholarship, but we can actually in some sense accelerate the pace of discovery, a very desirable thing. There's a final sort of high, um, high level uh, mandate here, which um, I think is uh, incumbent on all universities, but is particularly strong for public universities. And that's to engage the public in what they're doing, to make visible their contributions, to um, answer to some of the sense of demand for accountability um, when we look at research funding, when we look at tax exempt status, when we look at the ever diminishing but still in some cases quite measurable state support for some of our, in our institutions of higher ed. There's a connection there. And there's a final connection um, in, in the way we reach out. We're starting to realize that there are people outside of the academy. They aren't students, they aren't faculty, but they're out there in society and have things to contribute to the scholarly enterprise. Some of them go under the guise of citizen science or citizen humanities or hobbyists or people who are into studying material culture or art collectors or all kinds of people, but we're starting to discover that there are important connections back there. We want to make scholarship and the record of scholarship visible so it can facilitate those links, I think. So those are the kind of big questions, and I would hope that the leadership here, both the leadership of the university and the leadership within the faculty would think broadly about those kind of questions and about the opportunities before them to move to a position of greater open access to scholarship. And I think that the opportunities around a major academic institution are really numerous and pop up in a lot of places. Some of them, like open access mandates around the publications of the faculty, or the making public of theses and dissertations, are sort of classic and obvious ones. I'd suggest there are others that are less obvious, but perhaps equally as important. Um, many of our universities have libraries that hold very, very substantial collections of images which are important for scholarship. Um, they are used by scholars to buttress arguments, to illustrate things. And yet, many institutions actually put up a lot of barriers to the use of this material. Often it's not really copyrightable. It's too old, it's out of copyright, but 
they still won't hesitate to charge or otherwise make nuisances of themselves in making this available. Um, Cornell recently announced a policy where they said basically that out of copyright images that they held stewardship over would be made available without charge for academic and non-commercial scholarly purposes. That's, a, that's an example of a kind of an unexpected place where you actually can do something quite significant by um, really just policy edict. Uh, to take another example, um, Tyler gave us a really good look at some of the things other than traditional publications that are a really important part of the scholarly record. Um, two examples that he talked about that I'll just reiterate that um, uh, Georgia Tech is among the institutions stepping up to deal with conference proceedings. Every institution of size hosts a million academic conferences. Some of these are affiliated with scholarly and professional societies or farm their, um, their conference proceedings out to uh, commercial scholarly publishing houses. But there's a lot of amateur work here too. Um, a lot of bad amateur work, which often relegates conference proceedings to a sort of a gray literature status in, in situations where it really shouldn't. And in some cases, it's the most kind of innovative, one-off conferences that end up in this status because they don't kind of fall neatly under the um, umbrella of a succession of uh, annual conferences that some scholarly um, society has that move around from one university to the next. Providing a platform not just for producing but for managing and preserving and making permanently available as part of a library collection those kinds of conference proceedings on an open access basis is a wonderful activity. Um, and indeed, you know, often conference proceedings, especially if you weren't at the conference, are obscenely costly um, if you try and get them later. No excuse for it. Um, this, is a, this is a place that's just, you know, waiting to be dealt with. Um, the other one that's really important is the, um, the ongoing series of lectures and seminars and things like this. I don't mean here class recordings, which have a whole nother, which are another important area, but have a whole set of complexities around them because of their interaction with the instructional process and other things. Um, but the kind of, you know, incidental and occasional lectures and symposia. We should be capturing these. We should be making them available. Um, these are very powerful, and uh, many institutions now are moving to amass significant numbers of these. I don't want to talk too much about open access to journal articles. We've talked a lot about that today. There are a lot of nuances, a number of proposed paths to enlightenment there, and I'm not sure I can add too much to it um, beyond what's already been said. But I do want to observe that along with those traditional journal articles, and I'm thinking here very much of traditional journal articles, indeed I'm very mindful of the ironic situation we find ourselves in where um, We've, we're, we're just at the tail end of an excruciatingly long and expensive 20-year migration from printed scientific journals to scientific journals in digital form. Yet if you look at the articles in those journals in digital form, they mainly come in PDFs, which would be very comfortable if printed out to a scientist from the 1940s or 50s. Um, uh, the only comment you might get is, nice typesetting. Um, what's starting to happen, though, is that even these very traditional articles 
are starting to interpenetrate with underlying data in a much more intimate way than they have in the past as many fields of scholarship have become more data intensive. And the ways in which we are managing data are very complicated and diverse now, ranging from disciplinary um, uh, data repositories that take certain specific genres of data like gene sequences or um, uh, crystallography. Um, there, there are a number of these kinds of things. All the way through data that's going hopefully into institutional repositories or often is moldering in various niches of laboratories and offices at this point, critically at risk. Uh, some of this is being fed uneasily into the journal publishing process um, as supplementary data or other sorts of things, along with software, which is at least as important as the data and as a whole another genre of, of scholarly material that we've neglected sorely. We do need to think about not just preservation strategies for data, but data sharing and data access policies. And I believe in the long run, these are going to be at least as important as the policies around the journal articles which, the, which are underpinned by these collections of data. Some of the policy making here, I think, is clearly going to come out of the funding agencies who are collectively starting to recognize very strongly now that data is a major asset that comes out of the research process, and they're starting to get very serious about forcing the people they fund to account for that data, to at least present plans that demonstrate they've thought through what to do with the data, data sharing plans where that's appropriate. I think that it's important for institutions, though, to also um, take an interest in these issues. Um, I don't think thinking just about scholarly literature is enough in the open access area. The last thing that I want to talk about, though, is what I might characterize as the fate of the things that come after traditional journal articles. These things like the database of um, the slave um, voyages that we saw earlier today, that we have a lot of trouble describing, things that are partially source data, partially interpretive scholarship um, that can be used in many different ways that vary a great deal from resource to resource. And had we had time, you know, we could have done an entire day of talks on important new, new sorts of forms of scholarly resources, things as diverse as the physics archive, the romance of the Rose site, the Valley of the Shadows. Um, uh, um, there's many, many examples of these across science and the humanities. We face a really interesting challenge with these right now. Actually, so, uh, we, we face a whole complex of challenges. One challenge is how to make them economically viable at scale. Here we have a search for common platforms and common software for frameworks where we can do a certain amount of aggregation to gain scale. We have questions about how to fund them on an ongoing basis. Um, they are often produced by grant funding and the grant funders have a tendency to produce things and then walk away from them, leaving sustainability as an exercise for the builder. Um, institutions are clearly going to have to step up to the support of some of these, and certainly I see research libraries around the country, sometimes in partnership with 
academic departments or other parts of the institution stepping up to those kinds of sustaining and preserving responsibilities. There's a tendency to try and think about these in market models sometimes to say, oh, what we can do with these things is build an organization around it, get some marketing people, get some security people to block folks from using it, um, get some fulfillment people, and then sell it. And this is a model that I would suggest, at least for these kinds of things, is fundamentally crazy. We know where 90% of the use comes from. Um, it comes from the higher ed world. Putting all the overhead to basically shuffle this fairly small amount of money back and forth over and over again among these institutions um, is just going to create friction. It won't accomplish anything. And actually, the 10% use, by the way, is very interesting and very mission consistent. It's used by the public. It's used by K through 12. It's used by um, people in um, you know, the theater and um, uh, hobbyists and all sorts of folks out there in society who can gain some value from this. But it's not the predominant use. I think that one of the great open access challenges that we really face going forward is keeping these kinds of projects healthy and open and allowing them to survive, to thrive, and to be used without barriers um, in ways that we can sustain economically. To not, you know, sort of cop out and say, oh, well, we'll just subject all of these things to the discipline and the magic of the markets. I think there are places for the discipline and the magic of the markets, but I don't think that they are necessarily the solution to all things. And I certainly think that there is a very large place for resources that should be open access for the benefit of the public, for the benefit of scholars, for the benefit of society. And I think we need to be mindful that not only are our universities producers of very, you know, well-recognized and traditional forms of these, like scholarly articles, but they're also incubators of a whole new generation of this kind of material that's also going to be really important. So. I'd urge you, as you think here about open access strategies, to really think broadly and systematically, to think about it as a commitment, an institutional commitment to openness, to engagement, to the sharing and facilitation of scholarship, to recognize that you've got lots of specific opportunities and choices and policies like the one about the about a potential open access mandate, which I believe was much of the spark for this conference, but to also keep the, the kind of broader opportunity um, in focus and to recognize that you really should be working. This is not a problem you just solve. You don't enact a policy implement it and you're done. It really is a sort of a cultural value that needs to work its way into the strategic planning for the institution going forward. Thanks.